Hello and welcome to the Contagion Cabaret post-show decontamination discussion. My name is Vicky McGuinness and I'm Head of Cultural Programming and Partnerships in the Humanities here at the University of Oxford. We are delighted to host this event in our live online event series, which is part of the Humanities Cultural Programme, itself one of the founding stones for the future Stephen A. Schwartzman Centre for the Humanities. For our live audience tonight, if you have any questions, please feel free to add them to the YouTube chat box below. We will do our very best to answer as many as we can at the end of the discussion. Tonight, our excellent speakers will be exploring their project, the Contagion Cabaret, led by Oxford University's Diseases of Modern Life project in the English faculty and artists from the Chipping Norton Theatre. Following the original theatre production, they have now released a film of the Contagion Cabaret created while on lockdown. The link to the film is also available in the comments below. Contagion Cabaret looks at the contemptuous history of lockdowns, pandemics and plagues. Tonight our speakers will be discussing their film as well as offering their thoughts on historical perspectives of this current epidemic. I am delighted to now welcome our chair for our expert panel this, this evening, Professor Kirsten Shepherd-Barr, who will shortly be introducing our speakers and tell us more about the Contagion Cabaret. Kirsten Shepherd Barr's research expertise includes publishing in the areas of theatre and science, Ibsen and performance, and modern drama more generally, with her books Theatre and Evolution from Ibsen to Beckett, 2015, Science on Stage from Dr. Faustus to Copenhagen, 2006, Modern Drama, A Very Short Introduction, 2016, and the forthcoming Cambridge Companion to Theatre and Science, 2020. Most recently, she's published on how plays have depicted contagion. So a very, very apt host for our discussion this evening. Thank you very much, Kirsten, for joining us today. Thank you to our panel as well. And without further delay, I'll hand straight over to you, Kirsten. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky, for the lovely introduction and to Torch for hosting our live event this evening. Welcome again to all our viewers watching at home. I'll shortly be introducing our panel for a 30 minute discussion about the Contagion Cabaret, which will be followed by a question and answer session. So if you do have any questions for our panel, a reminder to please pop these into the YouTube chat box below, and we will do our best to answer as many of these as we can during the session. I'd like to start by introducing our wonderful panel for this evening. I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Sally Shuttleworth, Professor Sunetra Gupta, and Anna Tolpit. Let me introduce them each in turn. Sally Shuttleworth is Professor of English Literature at the University of Oxford. She works on the inter interrelations of medicine, science, and culture. And between 2014 to 19, she ran the large ERC research project, Diseases of Modern Life, 19th Century Perspectives. Sally is also the research lead for the Contagion Cabaret Project. Anna Tolpit has performed at theaters across the country and has appeared in films including Hellraiser, Hellworld, Two-Headed Creek, Run, Fat Boy Run, The Scarecrow and Confetti, and recently won Best Actress at the We Like Em Short Film Festival for her performance in Bun. TV appearances include Holby City, Moving Wallpaper, Waterloo Road, Teachers TV, and From Galicia. As a director, Anna's work includes Happy Even After, a play about domestic abuse, and she's also directed for theaters including Armonico Consort, Chipping Norton Theater, Polka Theater, and English Touring Opera. Anna has also worked on the wonder that is the Contagion Cabaret, including playing its Master of Ceremonies. Sinetra Gupta is a novelist and professor of theoretical epidemiology at the University of Oxford with an interest in infectious disease agents that are responsible for malaria, HIV, influenza and bacterial pneumonia and meningitis. Sinetra has been awarded the Scientific Medal by the Zoological Society of London and the Royal Society Rosalind Franklin Award for her scientific research. Her novels have been awarded the Saitya Academy Award the Southern Arts Literature Prize, shortlisted for the Crossword Award, and longlisted for the Orange Prize and the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature. Thank you to you all for joining us this evening. I'm now going to ask, to ask each of you to tell us a bit more about how your work links to the Contagion Cabaret Project. So starting with Sally, perhaps I might come to you first to ask you to tell us about the origins of this um, 
Contagion Cabaret? Yes, um, well, Contagion Cabaret um, was originally a collaboration between my research team on diseases of modern life um, and the um, wonderful Chipping Norton Theatre. Um, it was 2017-18, I think, and we toured it around the Museum of History of Science in Oxford, the British Academy and um, Science Museum in London. My project, Diseases of Modern Life, is, is very much concerned with the intersections of science, medicine and culture, primarily in the 19th century, but also very much with an eye to the present. Um, and we dreamt up the Contagion Cabaret with the Chipping Norton Theatre as a way of, of mixing boundaries, I think, of, of trying to bring in drama, song, history, and also medical expertise right into the mix. So to, we wanted to create an evening, not merely of entertainment, but something that would really capture people's imaginations and challenge them to really think um, about what they're, they're listening to. Mm -hmm. I think as we're, we're learning at the moment in the current crisis, there's absolutely no separation between science, medicine and culture. If you follow the science, you have huge social and cultural repercussions. And also we can see that the language that's been used to describe the pandemics in the media also has such an impact. And as cultural and literary historians, we've always been very interested in the language that's used to describe pandemics past and present, and also the historical parallels that have been emerging. And I think the epidemiology, a science that we're all becoming masters of, it seems at the moment, is very much a historical science based upon interpretation of the past, just as we're doing in literature and history. Now, when the um, pandemic started, I, I was really upset with the fact that we'd not actually made a film of the, uh, the original performances. And particularly when the BBC got hold of the, the Eames story, that's the, the story of, of the village in Derbyshire during the plague in the 17th century, where, who amazingly courageously decided to self-isolate to protect others. Um, and we had two wonderful scenes about this. And so when the university advertised that they were going to have um, uh, a COVID-19 urgent response fund, I thought, ah, yes, and we were lucky enough so I'm, you know, to get the money. So I'm absolutely very grateful to them for making it possible for us to create this, uh, this film uh, version. Now, in the original, we had materials on plague, cholera, lots on sexual disease, which you'll find still there. Um, and also about the viral transmission of ideas. And it was highly irreverent and we've kept it as such, though being very sensitive, obviously, to the fact that it's a very different world we're now talking about and that we have to think you know, about the suffering that people are going through at the time uh, and we're all you know, experiencing. I was also, in the original production, we had three medical um, speakers, um, John Freyter, Nicola Fawcett, and Sinetra Gupta, um, who have all, you know, they're all specialists in infectious diseases, all have been involved in work recently um, with COVID. And so we're absolutely delighted that they're talking in the, uh, the, the uh, Contagion Cabaret of their recent experiences. Um, and I'd also just like to say thank you also to Chipping Norton Theatre, because the question is, how on earth do you film in lockdown? Um, but I think Anna will probably be able to, uh, to tell us a bit about that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it's a strange experience suddenly finding that you're too relevant. Um, <laughs> in fact, in fact we went, when we went back to the Contagion Cabaret script, um, we discovered that there was act there were actually things in it that we we couldn't include this time purely because they were actually too close to the bone, uh, which is which was a strange, uh, a real uh, awakening, and it really made us realise what 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 a different life we're living at the moment to what we were, you know, only one year ago. Um, so yeah, it, and and I think the experience of filming in lockdown has been. Um, so sort of revelatory in itself, it, it, it's all become part and parcel of the whole experience of the film as well. Um, the fact of all of us very obviously being in lockdown, filming separately, having separate lives, and then having to create this thing together has been, has been part of what, what's coming across from the, the film as a whole. This is what I wanted to ask you, um, Anna, is, is maybe to tell us a bit more about the process of making this film. Um, making 
the, the shift from a live performance of this material, more or less the same, but with new additions and in a, in a, in a, um, an online format. And from the point of view of somebody deeply involved with this material for, for several years. Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, it, it was, um, how do we, how do we use the current experience that we're in at the moment? How do we really bring that to the fore in the material that we've got? Um, because before when we were, when we, when we had the material before, of course, it wasn't immediately relevant in the same way that it's now. So we found ourselves looking for things that were relevant, such as the contagion of ideas, um, the, uh, fake news, that sort of thing that all came into it this time. That wasn't necessary. We're here, we're in it. Um, so, so we were look, we certainly brought in new material which reflected our reality. For example, you've got the newspaper report from 1918 um, that wasn't in the original, um, and that was uh, that was an amazing find to find that there was almost the exact same response to the government's lockdown back in 1918 as there is now, um, and a few other pieces like that that I, I think we we added. Um, uh, but you asked about the experience of, of filming. It in lockdown, actually putting it together. Um, so John, so uh, who's the director, put the edited the script. We brought in the new material. We cut out a lot. It was it was changed quite a lot this time around, as indeed it has been every time it's gone out. Um, and then uh, we got the actors together. Um, there are twice as many as there were in the original because we can do that now because we're on screen. Um, and uh, and we had to literally ship camera equipment audio equipment to people's houses there were lots of sort of nightly handovers we had two bits of equipment going at the same time and then everybody had to rehearse separately in their own rooms um firstly with john on on zoom um and then they they would do their own recordings and then they were all spliced together um and we because just... one of the wonderful moments is when you have a, a group of people whether it's a couple of people singing a duet or a group of people singing, um, I think there's a great version of Bohemian Rhapsody on there. Um, and, and it really works brilliantly. And it, it's kind of masking the great feat of, of technical ingenuity that went into doing that. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's all down to the editor, Richard Nozzle, who, um, who's a genius. I mean, he, he, I mean, you know, he would be working at four o'clock in the morning some nights just getting these things together. You know, the, the herpes, the famous herpes tango um, has, it, it totally appears that we're in the same slightly odd 1970s Argentinian street. Um, and we weren't. Um, we, <laughs> and, 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 you know, there's all sorts of, I think part of the joy of it is, is that there are sorts of obvious technical breakdowns, but then we're, no, we're, we're not making a secret of the fact that we are in lockdown, this is what we're doing. I mean, you, you, you'll notice in the tango, my, my hand quite often disappears. And that's because every time I put it above there, it, it, would, it would go beyond the camera shot, but you wouldn't know that because there was more green screen above. Doesn't matter, it, it was, you know, that sort of thing, I think is part of it. Yeah, and in fact, it, it brings us to Sinetra. Um, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on how you, what happens when you do bring the two sides together in an endeavor like this, when you have the sciences and the arts and how they're speaking to each other? Well, I think first I have to say, Anna, you have to make a sort of wonderfully self-referential film about making this film during <laughs> lockdown. <laughs> um, I just think, you know, I've been um, involved in this show. Um, I've done it a few times now and in, in each time, I've done it three times and it's just been such a tremendous life affirming experience. Um, and in lots of ways it embodies something that I've been pushing right from the start. Uh, at first a little bit more quietly and more recently um, I've been a bit more vocal about this, which is that I think that we've approached this pandemic um, um, essentially from one angle alone when it comes to policy making. Um, the government has very much focused on what it calls the science. And I've been advocating for an extension of the axes along which we make our decisions to um, include the socioeconomic um, dimensions, the consequences of such a drastic measure as, as lockdown. And that's what I appear in this, this new version um, talking about. Um, but there is another very important axis that has completely uh, been missing, I think, which um, 
the Contagion Cabaret really um, underscores. And that is the axis of art, the aesthetic axis. And of course, by that, I do not mean uh, what material you're gonna make your face mask out of. Um, I'm thinking about the fundamental principles by which we reach our own accommodations with um, death and disease and those really difficult and awful trade-offs that we face um, when we make choices that, you know, about who should die, what risks we're willing to take ourselves and, and how we, we sh need to approach these sort of extraordinary events that shake us up in ways that, um, you know, really call into question how we see life and death. Um, I mean, obviously everyone's been turning to Camus, but I just have, you know, from when I read it, God knows how many years ago now, you know, 40 years ago, um, that little section at the end, I'm just gonna have to quote that where um, the doctor says, he knew what those jubilant crowds did not know, but could be learned from books, that the plague bacillus never dies or disappears for good, that it can lie dormant for years and years in furniture and linen chests. I love the use of linen chest. Um, that it bides its time in bedrooms, cellars, trunks, and bookshelves. And that perhaps the day would come when for the bane and enlightenment of men, it were, would rouse up its rats again and send them forth to die in a happy city. I mean, these sorts of existential queries, I think, need to be included um, in how we view the pandemic now and, and how we react to it. I think we've been thinking of it very, very purely in terms of, oh, you know, uh, it's going to spike again, we must do this, we must do that. Uh, and we have been adopting a set of really quite surreal measures to try and combat it. And I think we need to step back and think, how do we want to live our lives? What value do we place on life as it is lived? And how do we um, include our overall framework that we use to, to deal with life and death? How, how do we rely upon that um, to, to get through this period. And I think the, the Contagion Cabaret with its combination of humor and philosophy and realism, uh, it just does, um, it's just exemplary in showing how we need, can use these. Can we, we can recruit these elements in our life, yes. our lives and experiences to, to get through what we're going through now. Absolutely. That, that's um, something I wanted to ask you all about is really the, the way in which the um, cabaret looks back and asks us to think about how the past can inform the present. How can we gain new understandings of what we are going through by looking back at key, um, key scenes from plays or poems or songs from such a vast array of different uh, formats or genres um, and I wondered if Sally could say a little bit about that, because that was one of the, um, I think, the, the reasons why you chose this format in the first place of a, of a cabaret. It allows you to delve into the past, doesn't it? Yes, but to not merely as a sort of plodding, and this is a parallel with this, but to playfully look at the ways in, in which parallels emerge that you, you, you never even thought of before. I was quite astonished, really, when I saw the, um, the film as of early this morning, um, that the, the Dickens that I know so well was being reinterpreted. In, it could have been written yesterday, uh, um, the experience of lockdown. And so I, I think that returning to previous texts that you've read in very different contexts, you suddenly find that it has relevance now. And as Sinatra was suggesting, it, the range that you get in literature, I think, and culture, you opens up the questions, doesn't just close them down and give you facts. It, it, at the heart of my project, I suppose, is the whole notion that science is itself a cultural product. Um, and so you've got to investigate both the, the, the legacy of the science um, as well as that of our own culture. Yeah. Um, and, and I've also been looking at... Um, 
there's a research that um, is looked at, looking at how people go to health resorts, which is involved looking at quite a lot of upsetting material, people's um, letters before they die. Um, but again, it has resonated. That sort of material does not shift. You know, slight changes in, in cultural contours, but really the issues and the questions are very much the same. Well, yes, I, I noticed with the scene from McCarthy's The Road, how just as with the Dickens, you get this really fluid feeling. Um, it's almost a kind of telescoping. You feel this could be um, from 100 years ago or, you know, or now. I mean, it's, it's so relevant. And in that passage, especially the way the, um, the characters talk about a legacy. So these tins of peaches were left for us by the people who went before and we should think about the people who come after and there's a kind of um feeling running through the whole cabaret i think about about that idea i think anna puts it at the at the end she asks us to take away some message from the past a glimmer of the future despair or hope And that was um, uh, th that came up a lot in your in your talk, didn't it, Sally Shuttleworth? The the, um, the future hygiene um, mm. uh, was in, and that was intended as a. I think I think that the words came at the end about how that is this is intended not for now. This is intended as a as a blueprint for the future. Yes, it was sort of ourselves, uh, 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 sort of uh, ourselves unseen, uh, who are not ourselves but are ourselves. But but yes, you know, um, it was public health reformer in the nineteenth century thinking and saying deliberately, this isn't you know you're not going to take this now, but this is what you should be thinking about in the future. And it was all about environmental pollution, about how to think, how to live a life well. Um, and then, yes, his brilliant notion of having gardens everywhere, including at the tops of all the houses. It was all these ideas that are actually coming back to us. Um, so, yes, I, I think we have to use it to think through to the future, not merely get mired in the present. Yes. Do you, do you think that the, the um, current situation is, is showing us um, something about our attitudes to infectious disease? And, and any kind of gaps in, in those attitudes? I mean, does the show illuminate that? Does it speak to that, do you think? I think the, the, the show absolutely does that. And, and talk, I mean, we're talking about, um, well, what I was, what, there are two things here that I think uh, this kind of exploration of death and disease does. One is just highlight that our relationship with death and disease and, and epidemics, pandemics, is, is much more nuanced than what's been presented to, to the general public. And I'm, I'm, I just remembered how, um, so of course, um, Sweden has taken a very different strategy to controlling um, this pandemic than we have. And those who are critical of that strategy, um, I noticed that in one article they had um, a scene from The Seventh Seal, um, where the knight during plague is playing chess with death. And this, of course, was meant to be disparaging that, oh, look, you're playing chess with death. And I just think actually Anders Tegnell should be extremely proud of having the seventh seal as the context, if that of, you know, the actual political decision making. Because if you go back to the plague and you go back, or as the way Bergman treated it, I mean, you, you have that, the all the sort of existential questions that arise about what what is death what are we looking for what are we protecting ourselves against so there's that sort of existential layer, and then there's the issue that of responsibility and i think that the cabaret really um through, through its sort of playful exploration of, of, of uh, and bringing together juxtaposition of different pieces uh, with different textures, it actually all highlights our responsibilities to the future. And this is very important because I think just right now we are experiencing a crisis of responsibility, a sort of um, a, a tendency to hide behind certain roles and professions uh, to say, oh, I'm just a scientist, so I'm, you know, I don't know that, that my responsibility ends there a bit like, um, you know, in, in uh, Klaus Mann's Mephisto where 
He says, I'm just an actor, you know. I'm, well, and I think that the, all these um, layers come through in a very beautiful way in, in the way that the cabaret is constructed. Yes, and in fact, I should remind anybody who's listening that we're completely open now to any questions that you want to pop into the YouTube uh, chat box. Um, we're going to start taking those, but in the meantime, I just wanted to see if, if you had thoughts, anybody, on the issue of different types of contagion that the uh, Contagion Cabaret addresses and, and represents. So you have political, um, the, the kind of political contagion, of course, medical contagion, but the fears of contagion, um, as well as the idea of, of institutions having innately contagious um, uh, qualities. So for example, theater as, as highly contagious of, for the mind, as well as sitting next to people in a theater being possibly contagious. So I, I was curious whether, um, Anna, do you have any thoughts uh, on that or, or anybody else? Um. There was a there was a really interesting moment. We we um the, we felt that the MC character should be the one character that could go out of lockdown because it was sort of reversing the world. If you like, the MC is so much a theatrical um, convention that then we thought that to with everyone else being enclosed, it would be interesting to have the MC out in the open, sort of partly infecting people. So there was a sort of idea of it being hobby. Um And so we we took it to various places, and we just happened to be at the theatre. Um, that uh, the Chibi Norton Theatre, so it was obvious to do to do one piece on on the stage, and and we did it a couple of times, and it, it was fine. And then and then John went to the back of the theatre and did some more filming, and, and suddenly, as I walked on stage, we both felt it at exactly the same moment. This this sense that we were we were saying goodbye to something, um, and and it was it, it was almost like a ghost passed through both of us in that moment. Just this sense of this empty auditorium. Um, and and I, I you know I don't I haven't really sort of dealt with your question at all, but I think it was you talking about theatres being part of the of the contagion as well, and also being like a disease. You know, you think it, but it's so much part of the fabric of our society and our culture and our background. And and for you know we've been closed down before, but we but but never by an agent that wasn't human before. <laughs> Well, and in fact, Anna, um, one of the questions that's just come in um, is that following on pr from Sinatra's point about the crisis of responsibility, how can we ensure that we support the arts coming out of the crisis caused by COVID-19? By, by being very aware that it doesn't stop when lockdown stops. That the, the, that the help has to go so much further than that, because when the theatres go back, is going to be when when problems start for us because we can't continue the the, the whole USP of theatre is having audiences in a room have experiencing having an experience together and that is what the magic is all about and you know we could do we can do screens we can do contagion cabarets but ultimately there there are there are other people that do that so much better than us we're not about the screen we're about the 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 experience in the moment in the room um, and social distancing distancing doesn't work with that. So we need we need to be helped over the hump, um, and that's going to take us much beyond lockdown and into the future. Sure. Yes. Um, and thank you for that. And um, for 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 Sally Shuttleworth, what what is your best advice? A question's come in. What is your best advice you've come across from the Victorian period that would help us now? Ooh. Um... I think looking at things in a complete rounded way um, in that they did not separate psychological disease from physical disease, from environmental, that they, they viewed the problems that, they, that, that um, were happening in, in the midst of industrialism um, in a totality, um, in ways that with our specialization in the 20th, 21st century, we, we've forgotten how to do. So, uh, uh, and this I think goes back uh, as well to Sinetra's points about having to think, you know, not merely about a scientific problem that has to be solved because it has ramifications right across. And that is precisely what these very broad thinking um, public health figures or literary figures in the 19th century, and Dickens in his novels, for example, were trying to get at that you can't just isolate and say, right, we've solved this problem because 
they, there are tentacles right across different forms of society. Yes, did you want to speak to that at all, Sinatra? Well, I guess I've said <laughs> it's the X I've been grinding all along is the, <laughs> that, that we cannot look at it, uh, th this problem, simply as one we, we can solve by considering its, its scientific ramifications. Um, I think there are two other points I want to make with uh, regard to some of the other issues. One is I, I just love the idea of this sort of inversion of theatre that Anna brought up because that's what's happened. We are now the performers of um, the theatre of social distancing and the theatre of locking ourselves down. It's, it's become a performance and some of the rules of that performance are ones that um, have spread. I mean, that, there's a sort of contagion of performance uh, that's spread and, and circumscribed what we, where we can go from now on um, and, and bound us in this very strange drama, the drama what? of lockdown. Well, what do you mean exactly, Sinatra? Are you thinking about ways in which we be, we've altered our behavior toward each other? Yes, I mean, bumping elbows and maintaining this two, two meter distance, which uh, as far as I know, you know, it's, it's not scientific really in the way that it, this is all happening. It's sort of, okay, it's two meters today, tomorrow it's 1.5. I mean, none of, all of this is, is more, to me, is more theatre, really quite absurdist theatre, actually. Um, so, but it's interesting how we're enacting that um, theatre in our lives. So it's like it's been inverted somehow. Well, uh, somebody, but it's not quite yes. Our experience of theatre will help us get out of it, you know, kind of like um, <laughs> the exterminating angel. We need to like sort of work backwards now and get out of this room that we've confined ourselves in. But just one other point about like what have, what could we learn, not uh, so much just from literature, but our experience of previous um, pandemics and, and our general experience of other infectious diseases has somehow not factored into the way we're thinking about this disease. I mean, we know what other epidemics have looked like and what's happened in those times. And, and how we've reacted and what consequences those have had. And I think we'd do well to, to be a bit more mindful of those basic um, ideas. Well, this is really interesting because the question has just come in following your idea of the inversion of theater that you just mentioned. Somebody's really taken with that and has said, how can we create an archive for future historians and academics to work on? Is the film part of future ar archives? Mm. And and uh, we have been encouraged um, over and over by the, in the media, various um, newspaper um, web pages. I know the New York Times is keeping track of people's activities. They want us to tell them what do we do during lockdown, and it, it is a kind of self consciousness about capturing that now before it sort of evaporates. And I was curious if that fits at all with your idea, Sinatra, about this inversion of theater, sort of a self-awareness of, of noting down what we're doing, thinking about it as a performance that needs to be captured and go into some kind of archive. I think that's a very good idea because then it gives us that ironic gaze on that performance, which we are profoundly lacking at the moment. We are totally, I mean, irony seems to have gone out the window. It's just all about <laughs> <laughs> single gaze, should we say on a problem and um, you know if we document I mean in the same way that, that all the pieces in um, the Contagion Cabaret themselves are ironic um, a documentation of the performance we are now undergoing for us to spectate upon in later times will hopefully um, serve a similar purpose. It's interesting isn't it I often think about that I think about you know this great pool of material that's going to exist somewhere in the future because everybody has got on social media and everyone's making videos and everyone's doing writing about lockdown and everyone's writing diaries and there's going to be all this material um and i sometimes sort of this chill goes down my spine i sometimes think are we uh, will there will that time come where this is alien or will this become the new normal and will we find that hopefully it will release and it will get less but it's never going to be as alien as we hope and think it will be in the future. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're touching on two questions that have come up in the meantime, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> one is that it's been said that we will never go back to normal again. And what does that mean? The other one is, um, is it right that science will help us live, but the arts are part of what we do with life? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure if we minded to think about those, um, but does anybody want to address, address those? Hmm. I think we're very adaptable um, and that we shift constantly through history. We always try to create, oh, it was like this. It was only like this for a year or so and then things change and gradually evolve. I very much hope that the experience of, um, of COVID and lockdown does actually um, generate all sorts of new thinking um, mm -hmm. and that we don't return to a normal. Um, because there, are, there is such potentiality. If you think about the possibilities now in investment in, in making sure we go greener, that we invest in our theatres in new ways. Um, there, there are you know, real possibilities for thinking creatively about how we respond. So in a sense, you know, so it would be positive if we didn't get back to the, the previous normal. Yes, I think it's an opportunity to rethink all kinds of things. I mean, uh, you know, sort of, fantasy would be to kind of start from the beginning and you know wipe the slate clean and think about um, things like universal basic income and a, and a funding of the arts which um, just generally what we can do with public funding you know it could undergo a revision and of course at a private level I think many people have one of the few things that have come out um, as positives are that people have started to think about how they really want to live their lives. So in, in that aesthetic capacity, it may have some good, um, good effects. So I agree, we shouldn't aim to go back to that kind of normal, but at the same time, in terms of um, congregating in theatres and not worrying so much about spreading what I think is a no more harmful a pathogen than many of those that we live with, I hope we go back to normal very, very soon. Mm. Wonderful. Um, I mean, I guess one of the things that, that we, we see a lot when science and the arts um, meet is this fascinating area of metaphor and how metaphor plays out across those domains. And I was wondering if anybody wanted to speak to that. Do you think that we're seeing that at all in the Contagion Cabaret? Do we see that in our language that we use to describe um, you know, the threat of the, of the disease um, and, and so on. I think Sunetra has a, um, a discussion of that in the cabaret itself. But I was curious if that was something that, that, that you thought about when you were um, seeing the film again, especially when it all came together. Emily yeah. Taylor, Emily Taylor Peary um, is is her talk um, uh, really struck me afresh this time about about the war metaphors that we use for fighting COVID. We're going to war, and and uh, what we use them for fighting COVID now, or for fighting COVID, but also that the that this is not a new thing. Talking about it as as fighting the enemy has been has been done of old. Do you think that that's damaging because it? makes it so um, cut and dried? There's an enemy and then there's us, or what's the problem with the metaphor? Well, I think it's very problematic because it, it's combative and it, and it uh, seduces us into this notion that we can defeat the virus rather than reaching a kind of compromise with it or, or just living with it, which is very much more the likely outcome of, of this whole um, process. So um, I, I think those sorts of metaphors, again, kind of drag you back into the single axis rather than creating a more uh, holistic approach. Mm -hmm. Also the dimension, of, of course, of, of um, cultural placing and, and the suggestion that it's the uh, sort of Chinese virus, etc. Um, which um, I think we had material in the original that isn't actually <laughs> up there in the um, what we have at the moment, um, but where we were looking at um, in the 19th century, the ways in which the plague was the Eastern plague and then that, and then this sort of attempt to, uh, to 
um, vilify various um, forms of the virus by placing them culturally, which we, we see obviously is happening so much today. It's actually there, but it's, it's almost unrecognisable because it's been turned into this elaborate news report with flags flashing behind. Mm. Um, what we did, what we did have and we lost because um, we didn't think it was needed. It was so obvious was um, a quote from Trump. Um, <laughs> yeah. Where he helpfully illustrates all of the above. Yes. <laughs> I think with um, the idea of the Chinese virus and all that, the other thing that is important is, is narrative and uh, clinging to a linear narrative for this virus, that it came out of somewhere and then it invaded us and is progressing in, in, in a sort of linear way rather than the kind of more diffuse narrative uh, in which, you know, this is an international problem that affects all of us almost simultaneously, which it um, is very likely to have done given the amount of air travel that we have between various regions. I think that's another um, impediment is, is the sort of shoehorning it into a linear narrative rather than thinking of it as um, something more uh, uh, that has a different dimension. Mm. One of the things that Contagion Cabaret does is mix up um, different periods of time from which these works come. So it's all mixed together. We've got um, a jumping around from period to period and the sense of trans historicism that really works well. Uh, and one question that's just come in is about the cabaret form itself. And cabaret, the question says, is a dynamic form that thrives on the shared experience of an audience in the same place. Were you conscious of trying to foster the same sense of liveness and community even through the screen? We were conscious of losing it. <laughs> We were very conscious of that. Mm -hmm. And we, we racked our brains to think how, how can we make, you know, we talked about cutting the MC all together and, and you know, many people probably think that we should have done. Um, uh, but in, 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 you sort of, you sort of needed it just to highlight how out of place that character is within this world. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, when you're addressing people in lots and lots of disparate situations, it's so different to being in a sweaty room with lots of people and also with lots of people or in the same situation, which is something that we can that we, that we have now. We are a lot of us sharing a very similar situation, although Shinetra yeah, would, would definitely argue that we're not and that we're all having a very different experience. Um, but the basic situation is, is the same. Um, but yeah, it's a very it's very odd, and I, I really struggled actually with with that with that side of it, with with just playing that that MC out of out of sync and not having an audience to respond off to. to respond. I, I really like it in the film version because our, our experience, or, or when it was in the theatre, it was very cosy, <laughs> deliberately so, um, and that sense of distance when when because the first. Um, shot is when you're quite, you know, quite a way away in the middle of a, of a field and and then you're you're alone in all these various sort of um, uh, social uh, um, sort of empty environments and and it just seemed to highlight the whole issue of isolation and, mm. and so cabaret becomes something very different so we have the form but it's undercutting itself as well because it what it's highlighting is the isolation by its very form I think. Mm. Mm. Good. Yes. Yeah. So we, we also have a really intriguing question that I absolutely love, which is if we cannot be inside, shall we have outside theatres from now on? Yeah, it, it's definitely come up. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure it entirely solves the problem of social distancing because you've still got the actors. However, on the whole, I think outdoors theatre works better with distance between actors. So I don't think that's that's terrible. In fact, it, I heard today that the Globe um, actually rehearses, refuses to let actors go too close to each other in rehearsal because it, it, it cuts off the audience. So, um, so yeah, let's let's do more outside theatre. What a brilliant idea. I mean, other things have been suggested as well that, you know, we do theatre with the audience in cars and we do theatre for one, one group of, you know, one family of people, um, promenade theatre. Um, there was one suggestion where, um, which I'd read in an article recently, where a, a play would be conducted on a sort of rock in the distance and, and we'd have it over, over headphones. So every, lots of people are coming up with, with really interesting 
ideas. Um, I, I don't know, I personally would miss the idea of an audience having the same experience in the same space. I mm -hmm. think, I think I'm still clinging on to that a bit. Yes, um, and actually following on from that, we have another a comment as well as a, a question here. Someone has written, they really enjoyed the film. So thank you, that's great. Um, and they say it's great to have the project in this format too, and a great achievement. Are there any plans to continue engagement in any way? Oh, yes. Uh, um, well, we, uh, in, the, in the immediate term, thank you very much for the question, uh, that we have um, a, a competition um, for uh, students um, to respond to Contagion Cabaret um, by sending us in any creative response they feel like, you know, they could, I don't know, decorate their house and photograph it or something, anything they want, but that's responding directly to the Contagion Cabaret. Um, and if they want some ideas and provocations, they should go to our website. You should go to our website where we've we've got a whole page of ideas and provocations. Um, yeah, so that's that's in the immediate. Um, and Sally, you over um, to you. Yes, um, I, I think um, I'll be doing a short piece writing about it, um, but be very keen just to get it out there more um, because I, I think. You, uh, if we can get it properly launched, it will have quite an impact for people in the, as they they ponder on their own experiences in lockdown. Yeah, can can I ask you if if you had a particular um, as you watched the film, each of you, was there anything that you suddenly thought of that you wished could have made it in, or that would have brought something even more to it? I mean, what I guess we're in this constant feeling um, that that there's always more to say about this. And I, I wondered if you had had any thoughts about that. Who's going first? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't got any ideas. <laughs> no, um, yes. So having known the, the, the previous versions, there's a sort of sense of loss of uh, things that um, were thought to be um, too too upsetting for the moment. So I think one of the um, scenes from the play about Eam, um, where the two lovers cannot meet, because um, I'd instantly thought of that as, as absolutely typifying people's experience at the moment. Um, but I, I think you, uh, Anna and, and John thought that it was actually, you know, just too upsetting at the moment and too close to what people were experiencing to actually put up. It's a speech about um, the girl losing her entire family and she, she talks through the death of each member of her family and ah, uh, mm. I don't know, uh, certainly yeah. when we started on this project, um, it, it was much earlier days than we are at now and, and, and talk, of, talk of that just, just felt too yeah. much really. Yeah. Mm. It's, uh, yes, it's, uh, it's, it is sad to lose that piece because of also, in some ways, it highlights how uh, different and, you know, plague was th than what we're experiencing um, at the moment, um, which is something we, we should bear in mind. And, and But the other um, aspect of it, I mean, it, it was quite nice to have the two different kind of sort of the, the individual versus the community and how something that is so painful at an individual level can nonetheless be very much the noble thing to do at, a, at the level of the community. Um, so that, that, that was something I think that came, that, that was there. The, the juxta juxtaposition of those experiences um, really have both that, scenes, so. you mean, both, both, both scenes from Eam, the one about- Yeah, both, both the Eam about. scenes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it was a mistake. And I, I think partly we're aware that watching it on screen was gonna be a very different experience to watching it in the theater. And we just had to be a bit mindful of people's attention spans yes. and um, how much sort of loss and death and despair you can, you can show when you haven't necessarily taken everybody on the journey with you. Um, which of course you do in the theatre. Sounds like I'm making an excuse now, but but 
no, no, it wasn't an accusation. <laughs> it's just uh, personal. No, I loved it too. I loved it. It was so beautifully yeah. performed by the actress. It was absolutely heartbreaking. heartbreaking. I was wondering, because you, you have a function beneath the film where you can say explore the materials. So I haven't had a chance to look into that, but what happens if you click on that? Are people going to see the scenes or what happens, what comes up? Mm -hmm. that, that's for the, um, it's more for the competition, I think. It's for school right. children um, and okay. it just gives further details about what the extracts were and, and how to find out more about them. Oh. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, we've got a list of the sources on the website as well. So if, if you want to go to, if you want to know more about anything that's in there, you can go there. And we're hoping to put up the out outtakes as well, because we did sadly at, at the 11th hour have to lose quite a substantial amount of material for, for reasons of time. And, and there was some really good stuff in there. So we're going to put that up as well. And I really encourage you to watch it. Brilliant. We probably have um, we're kind of getting toward the end of the Q&A, but we've got a few more coming in. So let me try to cover these. And they're related. So one is, they're both related to the online experience of the arts. One is, how can we capture people's experience of lockdown if they are not online? Could arts and remote connection activity be used in some way for that? And the second one is, people's experience of lockdown is so different, as the panel has highlighted. The arts has always strived to widen access and inclusion in the arts. Can we do that remotely? Can we widen access to the arts remotely? Is that the question? Yeah. Uh, yes, and, and that's being done. I mean, uh, theatres all over the country have not entirely closed. They, they've, they've opened up all their sort of education wings and stuff and, and are putting out uh, workshops and... Um, oh, hold on, are we, are we talking about not online here? I think I might have missed the point. Well, we've got almost two opposite ends of this spectrum of, of the arts in lockdown. So there are some people who are not online. Um, how can we how can we reach them? How can the arts and remote remote connection activity be used in some way to help them? And then also you have um, can we I suppose related to that I guess is the idea of the arts striving to widen access and inclusion. Um, can can that happen remotely? And you know we're so curtailed in terms of the live experience, going to a museum, going to a theater, all of those live encounters, dance, for example, or a concert. And I think that's that may be where, where this is going, asking about that remote access. Mm. I mean, it's certainly something that we should be using the time thinking about for when it does all open up again, um, thinking about being broader in our, in our reach and, um, and I know that it's something that theatres think about all the time, but but maybe aren't always 100% successful at. I don't know. What do we do in lockdown? I, I don't know. I, I mean, beyond reaching people through this medium, I don't know. Any other ideas? Yeah. No, I, I think it is a major problem, um, particularly um, if we're wanting to reach the elderly, um, who quite often are, are not online hopefully have uh, relatives who could, can help them online um, mm. but yeah it, it has become the main medium for reaching people definitely yeah i think there's generations in it because uh, those of it, uh, people who are on twitter etc and facebook you know, have far more reach out than that than those who are not exactly there's levels of it isn't it and i mean I, I would have thought that there are very few people who don't watch television would i be right about that mm. So I suppose there, there's all sorts of arts going, just being simply filmed and, and put out there on programmes, which is clearly not nearly good enough. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just remarkable that you've been able to do this in a time of lockdown, and it's just a, a testament to the, the power of art. In fact, so, oh, so sorry, I, there's been one more late-breaking question. Um, so this is really for Sunetra. Um, we've heard art's ability to highlight serious themes like death and community in a crisis like this one. But um, what do you think about the different aspects of humor in the project? Oh, well, humor is, is, is a f fundamental ingredient of um, our, um, you know, how we deal with life and death and responsibility um, because there's so many, um, so many facets to it. And that's again where the 
cabaret is so useful. I mean, life is a cabaret. So um, our main mode of dealing with some very uncomfortable truths is through humor. Um, and so that's why the multifacetedness and how humor helps us um, grapple with these enormous issues uh, and piece together, make the jigsaw work at that level, I think is something that the cabaret really truly exemplifies. Thank you so much. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to start drawing things to a close because uh, time has flown. So um, thank you so much for sending us your questions to all our listeners. And we're sorry we, if we couldn't answer them all. And I want to thank now our terrific panel this evening, Sally, Anna, and Sinetra. Thank you so much for your time and for all your thoughts and comments. And you've certainly given us lots to think about. If you haven't yet watched the Contagion Cabaret film, a reminder that you can still see the film via the link we will share below now, um, or please visit www.contagioncabaret.co.uk. And at the same link, you will also find details of the school competition we discussed a little bit in the, um, the past hour. And I just want to mention it again, to enter the competition, all you need to do is watch the film anytime from today, Friday the 19th of June, then respond to it in any way you like. As Anna said, whether it be prose, poem, art, music, video, or, or another medium, and submit that by Monday the 6th of July at 5 p.m. Full details are available via the same link shared below, www.contagioncabaret.co.uk. There is a prize. There will be 150 pounds worth of Amazon vouchers to be shared amongst the winners, who will also be invited to take part in a video with actors from the theater to discuss their work. Best of luck, and we look forward to hearing from you. And so it just remains to say thank you once again to our panel tonight and to all our viewers and listeners at home for watching too. I guess we always say these days, stay safe and well. Goodbye. Okay.